Um, if you have Bibles with you, we're, we're walking through the whole Gospel of Mark. Uh, or if you can look in your bulletin, Mark chapter 10. So we're just walking through all the way to Easter, or the Gospel of Mark. If you're new with us, that's what we've been doing for a while. The other thing I want to let you know is after I preach, we often just take prayer requests. We call it community prayers. And uh, we're going to start a new practice where I'm going to have just some people come up with uh, afterwards, after I'm finished preaching. And they'll be listening to their request too. And then they'll kind of move off to the side. And if you want to receive prayer, uh, they are not magical people. They're just Christians who pray for one another, which is what we're called to do. And you can come up and simply say, my name's Nate. Things at home are tough. Things at work are tough. Would you pray? And that's what they'll do. So that will happen um, uh, after uh, I preach today. So uh, Mark 10. Um, and one of the things I was thinking about as I was preparing this message was I was 22 years old. It was in Wilmington. I was working at another church. I was a youth director. And a, a dad came into my office. And part of my job was I was over the recreation of the church, the church basketball league, um, which was a whole thing. Um, people in North Carolina like basketball. Did you all know that? They have opinions about referees and coaches and whatnot. But so this dad came in and I just thought it was going to be one of those conversations about something about basketball. And he started talking about his son and the jersey and the number and whatever else. And then he said to me, so I'm 22 years old. And then he said to me, I, I, th I think I'm, he looked at the ground. He said, I think I'm going to leave my wife. And I had no, I didn't know what to say. I was unprepared for that conversation. My parents, uh, there was never divorce in, in my immediate family, and I didn't know what to say. So I just, I think I said something like, I'm sorry. And that was it. And one of the things I've been thinking about as a pastor is divorce is one of many things we talk about in our culture that comes up, it happens in our life, that we actually don't know what to say about it. Or I'll say even better, Christians actually don't know how their faith informs some of these hard things that we go through in this life. And you might have been a Christian a long time, but you might feel ill-equipped. What, what do you say? And so in Mark 10 today, Jesus is confronted with his view of divorce. Um, and some of you are thinking, great, I brought my friends for the first time. I've asked them for four years to come to Hope, and now Nate's going to talk about divorce. Why is he doing that? Well, because last Sunday we did Mark 10, or 9, and this Sunday we're doing Mark 10. And this is what Jesus is talking about. I've never preached on this. But the other thing is, I don't know a person that has not in some way been affected by divorce, right? Either immediately or from a distance, um, and so that's why we're, we're going to go there today. But before I go any further, I want you to hear me. If you don't know me, um, this might be harder for you to trust me. But before we go any further, I want you to hear this. I am pretty aware of some of the pain in our congregation and the grief around divorce. I'm pretty aware that the church in general, Christians in general, have not always responded very well to people who've gone through divorce or face divorce. I'm aware that people who have been divorced often carry shame and guilt and embarrassment and anger and kind of believe they're damaged goods. And all those things, I say that's why we approach this topic today with the love and compassion and truth of Jesus Christ. Amen? As we should approach every topic. Amen? <laughs> and by the way, if you're new here, we can say amen. So, if we can have this chicken aroma here, we can say amen. So I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to look at uh, Mark 10, 1 to 12. God, would your truth go before me? Would your grace and compassion go before me? God, if, if this is about me or some of my thoughts on a topic, we're in trouble. But if these are the words of the creator of the universe, the actions of Jesus Christ, we must pay attention, and we must be shaped by your word and your truth. And we pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Mark 10, verse 1. So Jesus is on the move. Uh, as we know, we're headed towards Easter. Jesus knows what he's doing. He's headed to Jerusalem. He's headed to the cross and to the tomb. So as he left that place, he went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. And again, crowds of people came to him. And as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking. By the way, did you read that word? Tested him. Trapping. That's what they often did. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? 
What did Moses command you? He replied. They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. I'll explain that. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. Jesus replied. Pause just for a second. We're going to jump right back in. The Pharisees right now are missing the boat in several ways, but they are missing the boat on divorce, and they're referring to this section in Deuteronomy 24 where Moses made a concession, right? Not the norm. Moses made a concession to a sinful practice that the Israelites had fallen into. Um, And so a certificate of divorce... In this situation, Deuteronomy 24, was not plan A. You have to go back and read kind of the whole context of it. It was not plan A, but their hearts were hard, and that's what Moses did. But Jesus doesn't end there. Listen to what he says, verse 6. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So if you've been to a wedding, you've heard that. This is where it comes from. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. So it's a complex conversation. The disciples are like, uh, I don't think we got all that. Verse 11, he answered them. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Okay. First of all, this is not the only place in Scripture that talks about divorce. So with topics like this, you kind of have to understand the expanse of Scripture. But today we're looking at this. I'll do the best I can to explain what's happening uh, in Mark 10. Is anyone a little uneasy yet? You guys get real quiet when I talk about serious things. As with any biblical passage, uh, cultural context is key, especially this one. So Pharisees. Are they trapping Jesus with all these legal questions about divorce? I would argue, I actually don't think this is about divorce. I think it's about the Pharisees trying to speed up the process of getting Jesus on the cross. Regardless, this is a highly charged conversation for them. So we're thinking about their culture. This is highly charged. And listen to this. Do you remember John the Baptist who's preparing the way? We read about John the Baptist in the beginning of the gospel. We studied him. Do you remember why he was beheaded? Do you all know why he was beheaded? Because he questioned King Herod's divorce, right? His marital, like that he left his wife and then married his brother's wife. And John the Baptist, kind of in a biblical way, went, um, I've questioned, and he lost his head. So this is a contentious conversation, talking about things like this, especially with Herod ruling at the time. It was complicated. It was nuanced. There was lots of laws and rules, and the Jews of the day didn't all agree. So there's two camps. Shammai and Hillel. So these are camps based on rabbis. And uh, Shammai was more conservative, and their stance was you could divorce uh, a a woman uh, if there was adultery. Hillel was a more uh, progressive camp, and it was for any and every reason you could divorce a woman. Um, That was actually what Jesus was speaking uh, to, because that was actually the most common at the time. And so there is, you can go back and read all these historical documents, but there are rabbis who've given permission to their people to divorce a woman because she spoiled a dish. Can you imagine that? We'd all be divorced. Or because he found a better woman and the rabbi blessed him to, to seek that divorce. Divorce was just as common then as it is today. And I think those two camps in the Christian church exist, even though we're not Jewish. I think there are people who say it's no big deal. It just happens. And I think there's others who have a legalistic approach towards divorce that overlooks abuse and overlooks neglect and overlooks abandonment and tells people just stay faithful. And I would say to you that both extremes miss the heart of what Jesus said about marriage and divorce. The other thing you have to remember is in a patriarchal society, women were seen as things. In that culture, they were weak. In that culture, they were extremely vulnerable. And so in Jesus' day, a man could divorce a woman on a whim. But could a woman do the same thing? No. So here's what happened, and this is where it's a justice issue for Jesus. 
When a man in that culture divorced a woman, she almost automatically became poor, became vulnerable, often turned to prostitution, and lived a life of shame. So Jesus is not having that, right? Because what do we know about Christ? He is a fierce advocate for the vulnerable, and in this case, for the women. Okay, so what does Jesus do? Well, this is what I love of what he does. He goes back to original intent. You know, sometimes when you're working on something, you get way in the weeds. You go, wait a second. We got to back up for a second. What are we doing? What are we doing? Well, that's what Jesus, he helped him back up for a second. And he went back to God's original design for human flourishing. Genesis, Genesis 1 and 2. Right? We read it. He repeated it. A man and a woman, they leave their families. That's okay. You're supposed to do that. The two become one. He says that twice. One flesh, one flesh. He talks about holy union. Um, And then he says, let nobody separate that. So what is God's view about marriage? Let nobody separate that. And by the way, in a patriarchal society that we talked about, this idea of one flesh And then Paul going on to say, hey, it's submission. It's man and woman submitting to one another out of submission or reverence to Christ. Do you know how controversial that is? Because it was saying women and men were actually on the same page. And the Jews of the day are going, no, I don't know. We should be able to leave her whenever we want. And Paul puts a different picture for people that was actually deeply controversial. So this is what I want you to pay attention to. Christian marriage. So I'm not talking about marriage anywhere else. I'm I'm a pastor. I'm talking about Christianity. Christian marriage is a covenant. And the Pharisees saw it as a contract. Covenant versus contract, right? Because they're asking legal loopholes. That's what you do with a contract. Well, if we did this and this, could we work our way around this thing? That's what they're saying. A contract is performance oriented. So when the performance is done, the contract is over. I just saw Josh. If I'm paying Josh to fix my roof, we have a contract. He's going to fix my roof. By this time, he fixes my roof. The contract's over. We're done. It's contract. They have limited commitment. This is what, we, got some, we got some lawyers in here. Like limited commitment in the contract. You don't do any more than the contract says, and you don't do anything less. You just do what it says. That's contract. Have you seen a contract marriage? Are you in a contract marriage? Were you raised by a contract marriage? I have had a contract view of my marriage. Um, And it sounds like this. Kim, I will change when you change. Or I'm not budging until you do something. That's a contract. And God's original intent and design is not contractual. It is covenantal. It is a promise that God makes to his people, the covenant, and then we covenant together, right? As Christians, we covenant to one another, and a marriage is a covenant. It is a promise before God and before God's people. So when you think about covenantal love, which is different than contractual love, obviously, it's the theme of the whole Bible. Covenant is actually how God relates to his people. Covenant this way, covenant that way. And so this is what I love. Please hear this. This is the gospel message. Regardless of your performance, regardless of your spiritual wishy-washiness, people, when they find out I'm a pastor, I should read the Bible more, I should pray more, I should, I should, I should, I should. Regardless of all that kind of stuff, God's love endures. That does not change his covenantal love towards his people. And so this is what's interesting is that covenantal love is covenantal love towards his people. It is higher and deeper and wider than all the stuff you're facing right now and ever will face combined. And so to be honest, that kind of love, that God love towards us is hard to fully fathom. You actually cannot wrap your head around it. I don't think. But it's really easy to fathom a contract. A contract doesn't take much imagination, right? Here's here's what it is. God's love, covenantal love, you're going to spend your whole life trying to understand what that looks like and what it means. So, Remember, the major theme of of the the gospel of Mark has to do with king and kingdom. So people are used to their political things at the time, that political expectations. So are we in 2023. And, And Jesus is saying, there's a new king in town. 
who will reign forever. And there's a new kingdom. There's a new way of doing things. In Christ, there is a new operating system. We're not going to operate in this way. We're going to operate in a total different way. That's what Mark is about. So here's just some reminders. I'm going to recap a little bit. In God's kingdom, there's order. And we have all these discussions right now about all these political issues, and there's order. Read scripture. It is not willy-nilly. God didn't go, Phew, like that. There is a, a plan to the whole thing, a holy plan, a holy will. So when you think about the order piece, no man or woman controls a marriage. God is Lord of the marriage, center of the marriage. The other part, though, is when you think about order, God's orders, you know, sometimes adults with kids are like, we just need them to sit still and line up. That's not what God is doing. God's order is so that we flourish. That what he's saying is that, that the way I've set things in motion is so that the people of God would flourish. It's not just God, the creator of the universe, saying, I need to get Nate Stratman to sit still and line up. It's so that I would flourish. And so a woman is not a man's subject. She and her husband are image bearers of God. That's what marriage is called to be. A woman and a man are called to reflect his mercy and his truth and his grace and his compassion and his sacrifice. That's Jesus' radical view of, of marriage. So if you pluck, uh, plump that, plump, plop, plop that into the Jewish mindset, it is radical. I would say, understanding Jesus' vision of marriage in our culture today, I would say it is equally radical. And so all of that, that view of marriage, is to lead to human flourishing. And now, here's what some of you are saying right now, and I think it's a good thought. But wait, Nate, I see Christian marriages that don't flourish. I see Christian marriages that don't actually look very life-giving or fun or they look like duty and contract and all that type of stuff. doesn't look like flourishing to me. But here's another part of the story. Sin breaks the order, right? If you think about one union, I think about one flesh, sin tears the flesh. That's what's happening when we look about like in divorce. And um, in only, there's really only two specific exemptions given in Scripture. And by the way, if anyone wants to sit with me during the week and like work through some of this, I would love to do it. But there's really two specific exemptions given in Scripture to allow divorce. The one, and you see this in Matthew's Gospel, adultery. And the other word I will use is desertion. Uh, and with that, I would say is abuse. And that, if you think about it, that breaks the covenant um, and it's all sinful behavior, too. And th th there are behaviors that are opposite of God's will, God's plan, God's order, and they do not lead to flourishing at all. By the way, you need to hear this. I'm going to keep saying this. I'm going to say it again. God can heal and redeem the person that did the things and the tear. Right? I don't think it's a one-time tear. I think God can redeem or heal the tear. I don't want to say that. I'm going to keep saying that again. But Jesus' words to the Pharisees actually were, is less about divorce, and it was more about marriage. It was painting a picture of marriage. And so I want to just share a few thoughts that I think help us think about this as we go forward. And whether you are single, divorced, wherever you are, I still think it's helpful to talk about these things, even if we might today not all say we're married. Okay, the covenant of marriage requires great responsibility. And I don't know that we discover this, until we actually start walking it. But marriages have seasons. And these are the words as a pastor. See, now I can say it on the other end, but I have that couple and I'm getting ready to, I'm gonna marry some more people in our church coming up and I've been marrying people and I say these things all the time. And I'm saying, I'm watching them say, for better or worse. I'm thinking, oh girl, you don't know what you're saying. <laughs> I watch some of you in sickness and in health. I watch some of you who are loving people through sickness and health, through deep sickness. I've watched some of you that you guys have had good times, right? That cotton was high and you, man, everything was good financially and then boom. And you love through poverty. That's, that's what, and you know, it's not your fault. Like when you're young and you get married, you don't know. But you start to learn like what, what is required in this marriage. 
And I think that's why we cannot enter into, and we're walking with other people, you do not enter into marriage flippantly. I think that's why looking back for me is this, there, there needs to be for all of us thoughtful prayer, real dating, like, uh, asking good questions, premarital counseling, mentor couples, all these types of things. And with it, it's not like you actually fully know what's going to happen. But there's the things that it's a really important thing. But on the other side, what can happen is I actually think in our culture we can have very unrealistic expectations of marriage. Right? We, we can dream about this thing and think once I get married, you know, whew, unicorns, rainbows, and it's just going to be. And we have this false expectation. And I read this uh, by, by a guy named Scott McKnight, who I really like. And I try to put it in my own words, and it never works that way because he's... Um, he says it really great. Listen to this about unrealistic, unrealistic expectations of marriage. We have a post-Victorian romantic notion of marriage with views of weddings and marriages shaped by the modern industry. We focus on finding the right one instead of helping folks navigate the crucible of marriage in a culture of selfishness and unfaithfulness. Do you get what he's saying? Like we talk so much about the big day, the big event, or finding the right one and all this stuff, but are we actually helping people think, what does it require to, to have a covenantal marriage in a culture that can seem so selfish and so individual? So some of you were raised with a really dark painting of marriage in the sense that you heard people, you know, use the, like when people talk about the old ball and chain and, you know, comments like that. Oh, uh, once you get married, you're going to lose all your freedom. And we hear things like that, and we go, oh, my gosh. That's not what God's talking about. But then some of you were painted a picture <laughs> that was way too bright. We're just going to skip down the aisle. We're going to skip for the next 60 years. Just skip, 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 skip. <laughs> and no one's there. You're going to trip and fall and then skip again and crawl a little bit and roll around and all the different things. And so often when I sit down with a couple, I think they have a dark view of marriage or often a, a, a too bright view of marriage. And I guess my view is to have an, a painting that is both all the shades, right? All the colors. And this is a quote. I think, I, I think some of you should get tired of me saying this quote, but until you give me a better quote about marriage, I'm going to keep sharing this one. Uh, and I share it at the marriage retreat and I share it all the time. But a guy named Stanley Harawas says this. I love it. He says, we never know whom we marry. We just think we do. Or even if we first marry the right person, just give it a while and he or she will change. For marriage being the enormous thing that it is means we're not the same person after we've entered it. Okay, here's the good part. The primary problem is learning how to love and care for the stranger to whom you find yourself married. We don't fall in love and then get married. Instead, we get married and learn what love requires. I heard an amen. By the way, wherever you are in your status, whatever it is, what a great question. What does love require? For a meaningful friendship, for a healthy church, for a marriage, what does love require? And do you know what Jesus shows us by his actions? What love requires. That's what he shows us with his life. This is what love requires. Jesus, to me, even though he wasn't married, by the way, uh, paints an honest and beautiful and sacrificial vision of marriage. Okay. There's order in God's kingdom. There is sin that breaks that order. And then probably my favorite part is there's resurrection and redemption in the kingdom of God. Folks, that's the good news. I have watched God heal marriages. I've watched God heal people through marriage. I think more and more I've learned when, when we try to figure out, hey, how many times do I have to forgive this person that's hurt me? Just uh, two or three or seven? And the answer is what? 70 times seven. A marriage or a relationship without forgiveness is doomed. No one is beyond the scope of God's renewing and redeeming work. I believe Jesus can heal the hardest of hearts. I think he can reverse family patterns of unhealth that we've fallen into. I believe that we worship a God who makes dead things come alive. That's where you say amen, insert. 
That's where you say amen. That we worship a, a God who makes dead things come alive. That's why I don't love it when people say the phrase broken home. Because it's as if to say that thing fell apart and it's always going to be fell apart. And in Christ, I'd say, uh-uh, uh-uh. That God redeems and restores and reconciles all those things. And for some of you, or if you need to share this with a friend, for those of you in a dark spot, whether it's because of a parent's divorce or a friend's or whatever it might be, I want you to hear the good news in the dark night of the soul. God will meet you. God will take great evil and great pain and I believe bring great good. The whole Christian story is a story of resurrection, not just Easter. Death was there, but life came. And I wish that I had a do-over with all those things I just shared. I wish I had a do-over with that dad who came in my office that day. Let's pray. God, we want to be sober-minded about the pains and struggles in this life. But in the same sense, God, we want to be honest about the hope that we find in you, Lord Jesus. That when we look at things and we say it's done, it's over, you don't see it that way often and you bring redemption and new life and we, we praise you for that. And God, for people today that are thinking that there's been some horrible things done to them, abuse or violence or anything like that, God, I pray for healing and protection. God, I pray away any form of shame and that you would make hurt hearts and broken hearts and dead hearts come alive. Lord God, I pray over all relationships, not just marriages, but that your Holy Spirit, the Ruah, the, the breath of God, would breathe life into every relationship we participate in. And may we trust in that this day. We pray that in Jesus' name and all God's people said, <coughs> amen. By the way, um, sermons are often monologues. I believe in dialogues. I really am serious. If you're working through something want to talk, I would love to meet with you. I'm going to invite the prayer folks to come up and kind of stand on the side. And I would love for you to think about um, what are some things that we can lift up as a church that we pray for. It's not gossip time. It's not anything like that. It's how do we lift these things as a community before the Lord and, and pray for one another, whether it's something we want to celebrate and we're excited about or something that is uh, breaking our hearts. What are some things that we can share uh, and then pray for? And then at the end, these are the rise doors. They're going to split up over there and then the Artominkos eventually split over there. And if you want them to come pray for you, I would love to do that. We're going to do it every, every Sunday and I would love for you to intentionally just ask for prayer. Uh, if you need it. Okay. What are some things after all that? You now know one that has prayer. Okay, Kelly. Continue healing from, healing from surgery and getting my gut to start accepting food. It's a, it's a long process. Kelly, if you don't know, Kelly has been in a long journey, and we've been praying for Kelly, and we don't want to give up praying for Kelly and lots of ups and downs.